All right, folks, it's noon. Thank you again for tuning in. We have Dr. Chris Seabury from Texas A&M who's going to walk us through what is right now the watershed moment and CWD research. Um, we are getting excessively close to finding our way through this through genomic prediction. Uh, Dr. Seabury and, and his team of folks did a fantastic job of putting this together, putting a paper together that will outline a lot of breakthroughs for our industry and for, well, for, for wildlife all over the country. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't mention um, the USDA, uh, Parks and Wildlife as well. They've been great partners in this. Um, we're certainly happy to have uh, Tracy Nichols and Mitch Lockwood as partners in the project. A big shout out to USDA and Texas Parks and Wildlife and um, obviously Texas A&M. We, we couldn't, this wouldn't be possible without the good folks at Texas A&M. So Dr. Seabury, why don't you take this away? We're gonna go ahead and get started. We're now recording. So go ahead and start the, uh, start the presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Patrick. And uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, attending today. I hope that everyone can hear me well and clearly. Uh, Patrick alluded to uh, our thanks to our funding partners and certainly we need to acknowledge uh, USDA APHIS, Parks and Wildlife and the American CWD Foundation with Mark Myers because without those three entities, we could not have provided uh, as comprehensive of a study as what we were able to do and, and publish recently. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Felisa Ward here in our, in our uh, design department for, for making our, our lab logo for us a long time ago. We work on, on cattle and, and cervids and a good bit in quail. And so, so we're, we're thankful to her for that. And as well as to Dr. Jack Shear and Alicia Noggle and everyone at TVMDL who helped us uh, get this project done. In fact, I set up a lab over there at TVMDL and processed all the samples myself, along with uh, one other uh, individual who did me there. So that was a great, great uh, partnership and a great opportunity to move this, this project forward. Patrick, can you move on to the next slide, please? So this slide I've actually taken from one of my classes because I actually teach these things here at a &M. So this slide comes from a class and what I'm trying to uh, uh, illustrate to the, to the students in the class is that, you know, for many of the diseases that we're interested in, they aren't simple monogenic diseases. They're not cystic fibrosis. They're not some form of muscular dystrophy where the dystrophin gene is messed up. They are what we call um, polygenic multifactorial diseases, meaning that there are, you know, one of many genetic elements contributes to the disease, as does uh, uh, as does uh, environmental variation as well, environmental variants. So this concept of genetic liability is the unobserved susceptibility to disease. You can't see it with the naked eye, but it's the sum of the environmental and genetic contributions that lead to disease, which forms what we would consider a somewhat continuous range, but we only have two phenotypes here. And that's relevant to what we're gonna talk about today because we're going to talk about studies that were done on CWD positive and CWD non-detect white-tailed deer from a national sample. And so there's only two phenotypes there, either non-detect or CWD positive. Here, we're looking at clinical diabetes. So we can see that people that have an increasing number of predisposing alleles, you know, could end up in that threshold zone right there. And then if they make some bad choices about their diet, et cetera, decide to live a sedentary lifestyle, suddenly they could have clinical diabetes, okay? Well, most diseases that have two phenotypes like this have a threshold zone. And we're gonna talk about that too. I was supposed to give a, presentation on the results of this study earlier this year in Indiana, but COVID ruined that. And uh, when I learned about some other things that were going on, I also recognized that it was a good time to 
uh, talk about where do we go from here after I explain this paper and what are some of the most important things that I think need to be done um, and need to be clarified. So, you know, obviously an increasing number of predisposing alleles, it doesn't matter what disease it is, takes you to a threshold zone and then uh, lifestyle choices, exogenous factors, uh, various different environments could uh, allow you to cross that threshold. Um, so I want to talk about that as it relates to CWD a little bit later, but this also shows that this is how a polygenic disease would work. It wouldn't just be one gene equals, you know, one disease. It's not a monogenic. CWD is not a monogenic disease. Okay. Next slide, Patrick. Now, this is really an important slide. This too is from a class that I'm teaching where we, we're, we're looking at here a, a crop and we're looking at the percentage of oil that the crop produces, okay? And we wanna create two divergent lines. Um, one line that is a high oil producer and one line that is a low oil producer. And so if we start breeding those crops, um, only the highest producers, breeding the highest producers to the highest producers and breeding the lowest producers to the lowest producers, we can create these two divergent lineages. Those that are high oil content, which is what we desire, and those that are low, okay? So what we can see is that that percentage of oil, you know, we've, we've almost quadrupled that percentage of oil through this selective breeding process across what 75 generations or so of selective breeding but what's also happened is that if you look in parentheses there along the way those are the heritability estimates so in other words you know about 32 percent of the variation in oil percentage production can be explained by genetics. And as we selectively breed only the highest producers across time, we end up at a place where the heritability decreases. And that's a bit counterintuitive. It's a bit counterintuitive. Uh, students often look at me like, well, what, how, why? Why is that happening? That doesn't make any sense. It's actually evidence of success because all along the way, all along the way, when you're breeding these high oil producing crops, you're fixing more and more and more of the advantageous additive alleles at all of the different DNA addresses across the genome that contribute to oil percentage. And that is exactly the situation that we are gonna deal with in a minute with CWD. It is a, an additive polygenic trait, you do have additive alleles all over the genome for CWD, and you can create divergent lineages of animals that are highly susceptible and animals that have highly reduced susceptibility. We would tend to call them resistant, but we don't really know if they're fully resistant. And I'll, I'll talk more about that too in a minute. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> this study that we're gonna look at really has two parts. The first part is what's known as a genome-wide association study. And so what you do there is you cast a big wide net all across the genome using um, natural sources of genetic variation that are evenly spaced along all the chromosomes. And then you ask the research question, are the genotypes at these different uh, naturally occurring genetic variants are the genotypes associated with the disease, okay? It gives you a high resolution uh, mapping, basically, of, of, a, of a trait or of a disease trait, and it's become sort of the standard norm. So in this picture, you can see uh, a karyotype of a white-tailed buck. I'm showing all of his chromosomes here. He's uh, got an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, so obviously he's, he's a buck. And white-tailed deer have 34 pairs of autosomes or non-sex chromosomes, one pair of sex chromosomes, which can be XX or XY. And all those little red hash marks you see are meant to illustrate 
selection of naturally occurring genetic variants that are evenly spaced along the length of all the chromosomes. So that when we cast this net and we ask this research question, we are probing every chromosome at a, at a specific interval to determine whether or not naturally occurring genetic variation at that location on the chromosome is associated with disease, in this case, CWD. Now, I can't draw enough of those red hash marks because I would have to draw thousands of them on every chromosome and there's not enough room for that. But that's what we're really dealing with. That's how saturated it really is and how comprehensive the search is for what DNA addresses are associated with CWD. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a gene. There are plenty of functional, non-coding, non-genic elements in the genome that affect the expression of genes, but they're not inside a gene. And so all we're, we're attempting to cover all of that as best as possible. Next slide, Patrick. So this is the, the study that we published and uh, we paid for open access so that everyone uh, in the world could, could get a copy of it. And um, so I wanna just focus on right down there for a second where it says study overview in the materials and methods. I want to explain what it is that we're going to do here. And then we're gonna look at the results piece by piece and determine or describe the inferences that were made based on those results. But in order to do this study, um, we actually had to create some tools. So what we're interested in as the primary research question is looking at differential susceptibility to CWD among farmed U.S. white-tailed deer. So in order to do that and scan the genome for strongly associated uh, sets of genetic variation, we had to first um, develop a way to do genome sequencing on a very, very tight budget um, and be able to genome collect genome sequence data from both CWD positive white-tailed deer and CWD non-detect white-tailed deer. And then once we collect that sequence data, we have an analytical pipeline and framework that we work through to identify all of the sources of naturally occurring genetic variation within both the positive white-tailed deer and the non-detect white-tailed deer. And from there, we select, we select a specific subset of that variation to go on to what is known as an array. And the array is simply a tool. The array is kind of like a little computer chip that you put a, a, a DNA sample on and to vastly oversimplify, uh, it will read back a, a DNA profile um, to you from that animal, um, you know, based on the content of the array. And so we use this genome sequence data to build a 200,000 uh, SNP marker array, which means that um, there were 200,000 naturally occurring genetic variants that were selected and that passed all quality control parameters to go onto the array so that we could then read back genome-wide profiles for every animal. So for every animal, instead of getting, uh, you know, three genotypes, codon 95, codon 96, codon 226 of the prion gene, we're getting, you know, we wanted to get 200,000 uh, uh, genotypes per white-tailed deer. And what we found was that there was a really good reliable set of about 124,000 of these that were useful for this purpose. And so what we did was we made the array custom from scratch. We validated that array as a tool. Then we used the array to perform that first part of the study, which was genome-wide association, looking for naturally occurring genetic sources of genetic variation that were strongly associated with risk or protection because we can actually see the direction of the effect uh, in the types of analyses that we do. Um, and so then after that, in the second part of the study, we decided, can we, can we use um, 
this approach to perform genomic selection and genomic prediction the way that we do in dairy cattle, the way that is done now in aquaculture, the way that is emerging in beef cattle, uh, the way that is done in certain aspects of the poultry uh, industry. And we were very encouraged that we could do it because uh, the heritability of the trait that we investigated was so high. And so I'll talk more about that in a minute, but go on ahead, Patrick, to uh, the page with uh, figure one on it, please. All right. So if you look at this figure one, this is genome wide association using the array on a set of white tailed deer that are a national sample from you know, different, different regions of the US. Uh, and there are 807 deer, of which 284 are CWD positive, and the remainder of that, 523, are CWD non-detect. And the, the trait that we are analyzing, or the phenotype that we are analyzing, is simply a binary trait, just like clinical diabetes. You either have it or you don't. You know, if, 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 it's, uh, if it's an issue of, of coding, you would say zero equals you don't have clinical diabetes, one uh, would be you do. That would be a binary trait, zero, one. So here, zero is non-detect and one is CWD positive. And so in that first pane up there where you see A, you see a whole bunch of different colored dots. And then below those dots, you see one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 29, okay, and then X. So each one of these dots is a single naturally occurring source of genetic variation in white-tailed deer for which we collected genotypes, okay, and tested for an association with CWD status, zero, one, okay? And so in the first pane where it says negative log 10P on the y-axis, right below the A there, in the first pane, the dots that are highest in that figure, where it says PRNP there by chromosome 13, the higher the dot is, the more statistically significant that marker is in relation to differential susceptibility to chronic wasting disease. So what we see here is that the most significant marker is in the prion gene, PRNP. It happens to be codon 96, okay? And if we go to the pane right below that, where there are no genes listed, that is the variance plot. And so if you look over to the y-axis there, on the very far left of that, it says PVE, okay? That stands for proportion of variance explained. And what that means is how much of the phenotypic variance is explained by marker effects at these different dots, these different SNPs, which are just naturally occurring genetic variants. Well, for the prion dot, the green one there on chromosome 13, that particular source of genetic variation by itself explains five plus percent of the risk. So we would consider that to be a large effect signal in quantitative genetics. However, it still only explains 5% of the risk. And so therefore, this is not a monogenic situation. It's clear that there are other signals all over the genome because there are additive alleles all over the genome. And so all those gene names that you see are positional candidate genes or they are where the signals occur. They're either in the genes or beside the genes or close to those genes. Um, and this is the way that we do it in quantitative genetics. All the chromosome numbers relate to the, the newest, most uh, high definition cattle genome, which gives us the greatest comparative inference here uh, in relation to this uh, white-tailed deer array, uh, because the white-tailed deer genome is not anchored the way that the, the cattle uh, genome is. And so it's a necessity to do this, but we don't really need to talk about that. So panel A is genome-wide association without any other effects in the model. It's just genotypes and phenotypes. 
And when we do that, what we see is that the heritability estimate is 0 0.637 plus or minus 0 0.07. That means that as much as 70% of the risk can be explained by genetics. That no matter what, what uh, whether we're talking crops or aquaculture or cattle, poultry, it doesn't matter. Any heritability estimate over that, that's equal to or greater than 0 0.5 is considered highly heritable, all right? And so the selection response that you might expect if you wanted to breed only the best animals, like what we saw earlier um, with that oil crop, is that you know you would be highly encouraged by a heritability estimate that high because um, essentially the the selection response and the genomic prediction accuracy would be roughly the square root of that heritability estimate. So if you take that heritability estimate, put it into a calculator, take the square root of that, then that would be the the sort of upper bound of of how accurate genomic prediction could be um, without any other effects in the model. And that number is high uh, because the heritability is high. And so we were very encouraged by that. So we went on to do a series of other genome-wide association analyses where we sequentially uh, make the models more complicated. That is, we sequentially fit more fixed effects into the model. And so in pain B, we, uh, we are also adding um, sex and age to the model and getting largely a lot of the same signals. But what you can see is that for the prion gene, that dot there in B is the most significant signal again, um, codon 96. And if we look at the PBE plot in B of that figure, you can see that um, you know, we are explaining again more than 5% of the phenotypic variance, which is risk for CWD, which is the variance in zero one phenotypes. And so, um, you know, that, that was, you know, I guess somewhat of an expected result, but we found a lot of other signals elsewhere, uh, all over the genome, um, some of which have uh, positional candidate genes that have been implicated in a lot of other different TSEs, which is discussed in the paper. Um, in the pathophysiology of even scraping, for instance, uh, when people do differential uh, expression type studies. And so in C, we have a, a final analysis where we fit more effects, and that's really residual CWD is what I call it. And it gets a little, that gets a little complicated, but it's, we, we don't really need to go there. Suffice to say that the heritability is high. There are a lot of genome-wide signals, but the one thing that you should understand when you're looking at this plot is you're only looking at the most significant signals that are annotated there with little gene names and whatnot okay you you're, you're not appreciating you're not appreciating the fact that the things that aren't the most significant still contribute to risk overall genome-wide association is a tool to find the largest effect regions of the genome where the trait is concerned okay we did that we estimated the heritability of the trait from the the marker relationship matrix itself which is standard and we found it to be high which was encouraging for the second part of the study patrick let me see figure two please now this is a genome-wide association but it's done with a different phenotype okay and the difference is here, instead of zero one, like clinical diabetes or not, here we are um, conducting genome-wide association with a phenotype that is an interval variable, meaning zero is non-detect, one would be lymph node positive, and two would be lymph node and OBEX positive, okay? And in pain A, again, we are simply running the analysis without any other fixed effects. So it's just genotypes and phenotypes. And what we see again is a very high heritability estimate. And uh, 
that very high heritability estimate uh, is very close to the other. Um, and what we see is that again, codon 96 is the largest effect region of the genome. And in this particular analysis, it explains more than 7% of the risk by itself. And of course, we see some of the other signals that we saw in the first analysis as well. And in pain B, we are simply adding the uh, fixed effects of sex and age to that analysis and coming up with a lot of the same thing. So we have found the largest effects in the genome based on these 124,000 or so uh, genetic markers that are on the array. And we felt very encouraged by this. Now, some people are gonna say, well, what about 226? And what about codon 95? And that's a fair, fair question. Well, codon 226 is not significant. It's there in the plot, but it's, it's, it's not considered statistically significant based on uh, the nominal level of significance that we employ for polygenic traits. That would mean that the p-value needs to be less than or equal to um, uh, one times 10 to the minus five or one e to the minus five, um, which would be 0 0.0001 or less, and it's not, okay? Neither codon 37 nor codon 226 comes close to being significant uh, in terms of uh, uh, genome-wide association. Codon 95 actually got filtered. And the reason codon 95 got filtered is because when we do genome-wide association analyses like this, we, we, it's typically standard practice to get rid of very rare alleles um, because we're again, kind of kind of work our way towards selective breeding. Um, and we want to know if there are common, common genetic elements that afford great advantage to a trait, because those are the ones that are most easily uh, leveraged in selective breeding and, and uh, easily leveraged across populations in selective breeding. So codon 95 has a minor allele frequency, or it has an allele frequency here less than 1%. And so you don't have to be a statistician or a mathematician to understand that if you have 807 white-tailed deer, of which nearly 300 are positive and 500 and something are non-detect, that you, you can't possibly explain the majority of the, of the differences in, the, in, in, in those two groups of animals with an allele that has a frequency less than 1%. I mean, if there are 807 white-tailed deer here for the prion gene, that means there are 807 times two prion alleles because each fawn inherits one copy from the doe and one copy from the sire, the buck, okay? So at the prion gene in this study, there's 807 times two um, prion alleles, okay? And so what that means is that uh, if we think about it in terms of codon 95, um, we have um, we have uh, 807 times two, giving us 1,614 prion alleles collectively from all animals here. They might be the same. They might be different. Okay. Codon 95 is present at, as a H allele is present at an allele frequency less than 1%, okay? It's about 0 0.009, which means that we only, we only have very, very, very few. We have, we have, you know, less than 16 of those alleles here in this, in this population being analyzed. So how could, how could 16 alleles um, drive the, the differences that are seen here in differential susceptibility. I mean, without codon 95, we can estimate that 70%, up to 70% of the risk can be explained by genetics. That doesn't mean that codon 95 may not have some uh, de desirable functional effect, meaning that it may not be refolded very easily when, when uh, the protein that contains 95H comes into contact with PRP CWD. But, you know, here we need to focus on, on uh, you know, the additive alleles all over the genome that have not only the largest effects, but 
our more common sets of variation because we also um, are able to selectively breed animals like that without uh, negative unintended consequences of, of bottlenecking their, their genetics by chasing rare alleles. And obviously, um, codon 96 is common and it explains as much as 7% of the risk. So codon 95 uh, is not included. And even if it was included, um, you know, selecting for these single rare alleles is not going to take you to the promised land. Um, it's just not. I warned about that all along, and it, it's clear that this is a, a polygenic trait uh, with a high heritability. So we need to capture all of the additive alleles that are advantageous all over the genome um, if you want to be able to, to, to breed up the animals um, and reduce risk. Okay, Patrick, can you go on to um, the, the uh, yes, to that table? Now, this, this really kind of demarcates the second part of the study, which is to ask the research question, can we get an idea about uh, selection response? Can we get some idea about if we invoke a genomic selection and genetic evaluation protocol in farmed white-tailed deer, um, how successful can we expect that to be? Um, we, we want to sort of look at that in great detail. And so I don't want to talk about the results of, of that right here in this table, because I have another table about this at the end. Um, I actually want to talk about how this is done so people understand it. And I don't mean I'm going to tell you how to build a clock when you ask me what time it is. I mean, I think it's important to understand how we can do something like this and come up with these estimates of accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, so on and so forth. So can you take me to the next slide, please, Patrick? There we go. So I lifted this slide from a, a, a blogger website and used it to teach a class. So we actually have something known as machine learning. Um, and in that mach machine learning process, we have um, a, a very uh, specific process called cross-validation. And the machine learning is not artificial intelligence because I'm driving, okay? But, but we are training the computer, so to speak, if I'm going to anthropomorphize. We are, we are going to train the computer to make predictions. And the way that we're going to do that and the way that we did do that is shown in this particular slide. So we have the complete data, which are the 807 white-tailed deer. Each one has 124,000 genotypes worth of data from all these genome-wide SNPs or these genome-wide naturally occurring genetic variants. So that's the complete data, okay? And we also have knowledge of their phenotypes. So what we do is we randomly segment the data where it says fold one there. The algorithm will randomly segment the data into five pieces. You can see there are five boxes there. And when we randomly segment those into those five boxes, four of those are going to be used for training and one is going to be used for prediction. That one says test. So the phenotypes from that one have been removed by the program, okay? So what we then do is we use those four gray boxes that say training to train the computer about what it means to be CWD positive and what it means to be CWD non-detect based on the additive alleles all over the genome, okay? And so we train it and we predict on that red block, the test block, which has had its phenotypes removed. Okay, that's fold one. Then we go to fold two and we, we change the test segment. That test segment now is shown in green. That one was used for training in fold one. This time we're going to predict on it using the, the other four segments that are in gray. We're gonna train with those and predict on the green test segment. So that's about 161 deer in each segment here, okay? And it, it, they're just randomly segmented. Then we're gonna go on to fold three and fold four and fold five until we have trained 
and predicted on every segment, all right? And so at the end of that, we can actually look at those predictions as they relate to their real phenotypes from the diagnostic data. And we can get an idea about prediction statistics, okay? This process that you see here from fold one to fold five is only one iteration of machine learning. We did this 50 times with 807 deer times 124,000 markers, okay? And we did it 50 times so that we could make sure that the segmentation was highly randomized, that the training sets were very different because the animals are just randomly assigned um, based on whatever you specify for that the number of K. Here we have K equals five, so we have five folds of machine learning here. All right, we did this 50 times. And then we went back and we did it 50 more times by only segmenting, segmenting the data into three um, segments instead of five segments, which meant that each one was bigger, okay? But there were fewer segments. And so what that allowed us to do is to get the mean, the average of the various prediction statistics that we wanted that would give us an indication of whether or not we could apply a genetic evaluation slash genomic selection slash genomic prediction uh, program to this problem and actually reduce the prevalence of disease. Patrick, can you go to the next slide for me? So when we did this, not only did we predict the phenotypes, of the individual deer from the additive alleles from the genomic data. But we also produced what's known as a genomically estimated breeding value, okay? In traditional evaluation of livestock, people like to look at EPDs, but mostly now we're working toward a molecular EPD, if you will. Um, it's not really an EPD, but it's called a GEBV, a genomically estimated breeding value, where we actually are able to estimate a breeding value for a particular trait to every animal, okay? The breeding values, I didn't put them in here because those numbers don't, they wouldn't mean anything to you. The, the breeding value distribution of the predicted breeding values looks identical to the, to the binary CWD predicted phenotypes here. It's just the numbers are different, okay? But the reason that I put this into the paper and the reason I'm showing it to you is because intuitively it should be much more valuable to you. In other words, when we do this training and prediction, we can predict a phenotype for an animal and we can go back and look at a reconciliation of its predicted phenotype to the diagnostic data. So what we see is there's a natural break in the predicted phenotypes. That natural break occurs at 0 0.5 here, meaning that everything that gets goes to the right of 0 0.5 more towards one are animals that have increasing levels of, of susceptibility genome-wide. They have a much higher genetic liability, just like the graph we looked at. And animals that uh, go from uh, 0 0.5 toward 0, going away from 0 0.5 toward 0, those are animals that have uh, increasing numbers of additive alleles for protection or for reduced risk or for reduced susceptibility, or you might say enhanced resistance. It doesn't matter what you call it or how you call it. You're talking about the same thing. It's just that we kind of avoid the term resistance because we don't know if that resistance is, is complete. Um, and so anyway, that, that brings up an important point, which is if we move over to the far left in this graph, what we can see is that we have animals with predicted phenotypes of even less than zero, meaning that those are the ones that are expected to have the most additive alleles for reduced susceptibility. Some of those might actually be fully resistant. We don't know. But the prevailing hypothesis for how resistance might work is rooted in the amplification efficiency of the conversion 
of the normal host prion protein to PRP CWD when it encounters PRP CWD, okay? So think about this, get out a little piece of paper and write down, write down a couple numbers. If we, if we, if the very, very best animals have an amplification efficiency of, of one E to the minus 100 or one times 10 to the negative 100, you know, that would be zero point and then what, 98 zeros and, and then a one, right? Versus how about an animal that has an amplification efficiency of 0 0.9, meaning that it's going to highly amplify PRP CWD when those two proteins encounter one another, when they're exposed to PRP CWD. Well, we don't know if on that very, very, very far left, we don't know if that amplification efficiency for the very best animals is zero. If it's zero, that means they're completely resistant. They will not amplify that PRP CWD protein when they come into contact with it, when they're exposed, okay? But if they have a very, very, very low amplification efficiency, well, then, you know, they may, they, they may uh, live a, a long and healthy life and not show any clinical signs. And, and uh, they may test uh, negative by IHC. Who knows? We, we, we don't know this, but we need to understand that if we go to an infected premise and the goal is to do on the hoof studies, we need to understand that if we genetically profile and evaluate all the animals that are on site there to understand how they rate in this genetic evaluation, where on this graph do they score, we might end up in a, in a place where let's say we don't have any animals that are quite as good as the best ones we see here in this national sample, right? I mean, what if the very best ones that, that we find in this in, infected facility have predicted phenotypes that hover just above zero, okay? Those aren't the very best animals that we've identified in a, in a national sample. And so then we go test them, uh, for instance, in a, in a, in a pen type study with, with uh, increasing levels of exposure. You know, we don't know. We, 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 don't, we, we can't expect that they're going to perform as well as the very best animals that we, that we identified in a national sample. So when you put the animals on test, you need to have reasonable expectations. Um, you also need to identify those thresholds by, by um, having different exposure regimes because it's a common myth that, you know, something like this is going to just create animals that, um, that uh, are more tolerant and that are just gonna shed a bunch and then they're just gonna infect everything. See, tolerance is a different trait than resistance. And there's a nice nature paper that talks about tolerance, resistance, and infectivity, and how those are different but correlated traits exactly in the context that I'm describing here. And this has been known for a long, long time. So I'll talk a bit more about that at the end when I talk about some additional research that, that uh, needs to be done. But I've circled here in green, you know, the, a group of the best animals. And I've circled in red a group of the animals that are the less desirable, more susceptible animals. This, this natural break in the predicted phenotypes is not an artifact of, of the zero one phenotypes that were used for the analysis. Because if I do this same type of thing with uh, mastitis data and dairy cattle, I don't get a nice break right there. There really are, there really does seem to be sort of two lineages of deer with increasing susceptibility and those with, with uh, uh, reduced levels of susceptibility or increasing levels of resistance. And so that, uh, that was evident. I've done a lot of population structure analyses that I didn't uh, put in the paper. And um, when I look at certain sets of data, I can see a, a clear, much more clear delineation of that structure based on what you're seeing here, okay? Uh, Patrick, um, so, so anyway, before I leave this, this is kind of the basis of the genetic evaluation. If we run the animals through and we evaluate them, we can predict a phenotype for them. Um, we can also 
uh, produce a genomically estimated breeding value. Now, in, in theory and practice, um, I would I would probably be using those, but again, the the distribution here looks identical to the to the predicted phenotypes. And just so that we're clear on what's happening here, this is a blind prediction, okay? Because the phenotypes are removed by the program when we make the predictions. And so when we do this training and prediction, these are blind predictions. There, there's, there's, no, there's no way to cheat it here. Okay, Patrick, go on to the next slide, please. So what are the details of that prediction? Well, for any of you that have been following COVID, and I know there's a range of opinions about COVID ranging from, you know, it's uh, not a real disease to it's going to end the world. But, but the, uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that there is a diagnostic test for COVID, the virus, um, and the sensitivity of that diagnostic test is, is 0.7 or 70%. Well, I'm almost reaching a similar sensitivity here at 67% with nothing but the genotypes, okay? So when I make these genomic predictions, I'm actually predicting blindly the phenotypes of the animals, and then I am going back and reconciling that with the, with the uh, diagnostic data. And you can see the different models there and the different K-fold subsamples, how we segmented the data. But one of the most important things is, is that mean genomic prediction accuracy. You see that it hovers there around 81%, which means that we can predict with about 81% accuracy the, the phenotype of the animal. Now, I didn't mention it earlier, but Patrick, go back one slide just for a second. <clears throat> when we determine the accuracy here, um, in order to do that, um, we, we utilize this natural break in the, in, the, in the phenotypes as they're predicted. So you see that there's that natural break right there centered on 0.5. So all animals that get a predicted phenotype that's 0.5 or greater, those animals are predicted to be positive, okay? The ones that have a predicted phenotype less than 0.5 are predicted to be non-detect, okay? Patrick, take me back to the next slide. So when we do the genomic prediction, that's the way that we are doing it. And what we find is that it turns out that that's 81% accurate when we align that to the true um, diagnostic data. The formula for accuracy is given there and TP just means true positive from IHC diagnostics. TN means true negative. Um, and these are established formulas. So um, I realized that uh, TN means non-detect, obviously it's IHC non-detect divided by uh, again, true positive from diagnostics plus false negative, that's FN. False negative is me in the prediction, okay? I'm predicting it not to be positive, okay? But it is. And then plus FP, which is false positive. I'm predicting it to be positive, but it's not. And then plus, again, the, 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 the true negative or the non-detect as evidenced by diagnostics. So you're you're, you're in the accuracy there, you're accounting for false negatives and false positives. Those false negatives and false positives come from the genomic prediction equations, okay? Now, one of the reviewers, I had made mention in the paper that the real challenge in doing this was gonna be false negatives, okay? That they are what is driving the accuracy down, that they are what is driving the sensitivity down, um, and the reviewer agreed, but the reviewer also wanted me to point out um, something I thought was fairly obvious, but he wanted me to talk more about it or she, and that was that the specificity could be even higher. The specificity over there um, could be higher, except that I'm predicting animals that are susceptible and they just haven't yet been exposed, okay? Um, which I agreed with, so I added it to the paper. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, even with these types of challenges, we're reaching a sensitivity that's close to 70%. And I think all of this can become even more accurate uh, because my next plans are to actually, um, I'm doing a, a, a blind validation study um, just as I've done it here. 
uh, and um, I'm also going to redesign the array for two reasons. I'm going to attempt to identify noise in the array that uh, that basically distracts or antagonizes from our ability to achieve higher accuracies, higher sensitivities, and higher specificities. That's the simplest way that I can put it. But I also want to achieve uh, an array design that would be so cheap that it could be widely, widely used and implemented. And so I'm going to strive to, to redesign the array to maximize the accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity, but also minimize the cost. Um, and so that that's sort of what I'm working on now, this blind validation and this redesign of the array. Um, however, I want to take the the uh, last few minutes to um, kind of point out that you know there are a number of things that still need to be done. And one of those things is when we go in and we're going to put animals on test, we need to pre-screen the animals. We need to compare their predicted phenotypes to what we have from a national sample and sort of understand collectively from that national sample plus those animals, wh where do we stand there? You know, I mean, how do those animals score in the genetic evaluation? Is it is it possible that there are some uh, populations that you know that don't have a large number of of animals that are that are the most desirable animals? Sure, sure, it's possible. But by identifying you know sort of the best of what they have and knowing where that stands in that graph, that allows you to to uh, understand. Um, what you can expect uh, in various different testing environments, all right? So what we really need to do is find some of the very best animals that we can find, breed those animals, and put those animals on test, and then sequentially put other animals on test that have lower scores, if you will, that are you know, sequentially less desirable, so we understand the threshold, so that we understand what the animals can tolerate in the way of exposure, uh, because you know it, it's it's highly likely that this idea of, of amplification efficiency is a, a a big primary thing. But one of the things that may also affect resistance, if you will, air quote resistance, is variation in trafficking. Okay, we don't think about that. But these animals, when they're exposed, that PRP CWD is going to be trafficked. And it, it may be that some of the uh, heritability that we're picking up on here doesn't just relate to amplification efficiency, that it relates to trafficking efficiency. So for instance, some animals, when they're exposed, they may just traffic it out their rear end, okay? And others, they may traffic it to some of the the tissues that are the target tissues that um, we later detect disease in. Uh, and the, the efficiency of that process may be variable among animals as a function of their genomic background. And so one way that that can be figured out is putting the best animals on test, putting sequentially lower animals on test, using something like PMCA or RT Quick to test their feces, okay? In a in a in variably variably infected environments, you know, because eventually what we want to do is be able to understand um, the difference between infectivity, tolerance, um, and resistance, and we also want to be able to confirm exposure. In other words, if we go in with the very best animals, and let's just assume for a second and, a, and pretend that they are completely resistant, okay? And we go in and we start fecally testing them at intervals in a highly infected environment, and we get an RT quick or PMCA positive. Well, one inference would be, oh, they're, they're asymptomatic shedders, perhaps. I don't think that's a correct inference, okay? What, what if we eventually test them by IHC and find that they're negative? Um, well, that, that, that's problematic, right? 
especially if they're kept around for a long time, because then you can't really deduce that it's just an early infection, right? You're confirming exposure in a highly infected environment. And what that animal that scores best does uh, in terms of trafficking and amplification efficiency is very, very important. It's important for resistance. It's important for tolerance. Tolerance is defined as the animal's ability to resist uh, a reduction in fitness, even though they're infected. And what that means is an animal that that is infected, it is amplifying, uh, it would be trafficking correctly uh, for the pathophysiology of disease, but it wouldn't show any clinical signs, okay? Um, those that are uh, variation in infectivity would also mean animals that are variable in how much they shed, okay? So in order to tweeze this apart, there's going to have to be a multi-level multi -level study design ranging from putting animals on tests that are the best and propagating them to sequentially putting animals on tests that have lower genetic evaluation scores. And then we will be able to start to sort some of this out, I think. And uh, I think that our friends and partners at the various funding agencies know this. And I think that uh, there's a decent probability that some of this may happen in the future. I just think that, uh, you know, we need to be careful um, what inferences we draw uh, and how we engage in these various studies so we can make sure that we cover all the bases necessary to really understand sort of what's happening there. I've got several other ideas that tie into what I've just discussed here, but uh, that would take us over time. I think I've probably said enough. And what I'm going to do now is continue this, this blind validation by predicting blindly on the animals and then receiving the, uh, the diagnostic data and, and marrying that up to what I predicted. But, uh, you know, I, I fully expect that the accuracy will be uh, very similar um, to what we've what we've already seen. I also want to point out that we're not going to find all the positives with this genetic evaluation. The heritability is not 100%. At best, it's 70. Okay, so we're going to miss some positives. We're, we're going to have false negatives. Okay, and that's just the nature of the beast. But I think that we can sequentially reduce risk enough to reduce the prevalence. And I, I actually think that that probably will, will be meaningful and will work. We just have to be careful that we define these other traits. Um, and there's a great nature paper, this has been known a long time, but there's a great nature paper that summarizes this from 2019 about how resistance is different from tolerance, is different from infectivity and that they all have underlying heritabilities. And so and and so I would I would make that available to Patrick um, for anybody that wants to see it and, and read about it. But we need to consider those things uh, when we're doing this. I've got one question here that says how stable is the normal confirmation of the prion protein? Can he suggest various methods that the P prion protein might change? Well, I mean, even, even the PMCA and RT quick methods that are amplification methods have, you know, that they, they have sort of these, these false positive aggregation events that occur uh, at various different frequencies, you know, I mean, you can look up the literature there and, 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 and see that none, none of these diagnostics like that are, are perfect, but um, given the fact that those types of things can happen with some of those amplification methods. I mean, I don't, <clears throat> I would tend to think that the normal prion protein, uh, the normal cellular prion protein really isn't that stable. Um, I would think that exogenous factors uh, and or um, uh, obviously PRP CWD could destabilize it and refold it. I mean, if the real question is, do I think that CWD could ever happen spontaneously. I mean, I, I, I guess I would say I, certain, I certainly would not um, exclude that as a possibility. I think that 
there are very likely multiple origins of CWD, uh, multiple origins of disease. And I wouldn't exclude the possibility of uh, spontaneity, but but what I do think is, uh, I do think that, uh, yes, I've got one other question and I'll answer that question just momentarily, Patrick. Um, I do think that I, I did test, which I didn't put in the paper, but I did test for significant regional effects uh, in this data, in this paper, and I didn't find any. And the reason I did that was under the premise that if there were these different functional strains that existed, they would tend to cluster by the regions that they originated in. And so I tried to do what's known as a genotype by environment interaction analysis, which I did do, and I, there wasn't any meat on that bone. So I think that um, you know, CWD as a disease has to be fairly uniform or we wouldn't be able to get a heritability estimate that is as high as 70% across a national sample. So I've got a question here. Can this genome analysis be used for other diseases like EHD? Absolutely, totally can. EHD though is a tough one. It's actually harder to do than CWD because, because uh, EHD and blue tongue get blamed for a lot of dead loss in the absence of appropriate diagnostics, et cetera. And so having very, very, what I like to call precision phenotypes with precision diagnostics would be the only way that you could do an EHD type project and have it be meaningful uh, because it's, it's, it's actually a little bit dirtier of a trait and more complicated to do than CWD because CWD status is solely and completely based on IHC. And so, um, you know, it, it, we would have to have very, very strict diagnostics and uh, experimental design to make an EHD study work. But yes, any heritable trait this can work for. Dr. Seabury, the next question is, is the gold standard IHC for years to come? I think that, well, in my view, I mean, I'm, I, I would say IHC, I would, I would prefer that IHC be used for continuity. I mean, we've got a tremendous amount of uh, investment in doing what we've done here. It seems to work well. Um, if we decide to change that diagnostic to something else that, you know, may or may not have a higher false positive rate, um, we don't know the correlation between something like uh, PMCA and RT Quick and IHC. Uh, I just discussed the ability to confirm exposure. Uh, for instance, uh, a, a study that we should explore. Um, you know, and so anyway, if you go and change it, you know, you're you're throwing a lot of new noise into the into the whole process. We would actually have to repeat some of the things that we've done here in order to understand how changing to another diagnostic would affect that, you know? And so I would hope that IHC is going to be heavily used long into the future. I would hope that things like RT Quick and PMCA will not be relied on solely at all, um, that they would be used as a tool as I suggested. Two more questions, Dr. Sieber. We've got actually kind of a laundry list that we're gonna go through here. so I'll. Um... I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can with questions. Um, what are your thoughts on the validation of these candidate genes to identify CWD susceptible individuals in other species, in particular elk and mule deer? That's the first question. And then the second question is, with appreciation on how genomically identifying CWD susceptible deer in farm situations can be implemented, how do you think using this tool in free ranging populations would work? So okay, those are, those are great questions. I think I can probably answer those. So, so a candidate gene approach, if we just assume for a second here, if we assume for a second that um, CWD and elk and CWD and mule deer is also polygenic, additive polygenic, then a candidate gene approach is not gonna take you to the promised land. Because even if you happen to 
find that one of the candidate genes is large effect, that it can explain 7% of the risk, it still only explains 7% of the risk. And so I don't really see a candidate gene approach as being uh, a road to success for what is most likely a polygenic trait with environmental influence. So I think that the elk and the mule deer have to be done this way because I, you know, if I were a betting man, I will bet you that we will find similar results uh, where it will fit nicely to an additive polygenic model and you will not be able to explain enough of the risk with a few candidate genes to use that as a organized breeding program, okay? It's different from sheep. You know, you're going to explain about 80% of the of the risk with the sheep codons, all right, that, that are used, maybe a little bit more. It's just a little bit different, probably because CWD likely has multiple origins of disease is my underlying hypothesis. I don't know if that's true, but I, I feel that way based on what I, some s signatures that I see in the data themselves. In terms of in terms of using this on free roaming or free ranging populations, that's a good question. So we already have states that have attempted to highly depopulate big areas that were positive that are free ranging low fence situations. Um, and we have states that have attempted to repopulate animals where they've had a big die off. I mean, here in the state of Texas, we have endemic, endemic anthrax. and so. We had a bad anthrax year uh, not too long ago, and so triple T became popular. We wanted to um, trap and uh, transport deer um, to replace the dead loss from uh, an anthrax outbreak. Well, whether we're doing that here in the state of Texas for that reason, or whether we're trying to um, reintroduce deer to places that were uh, attempted to be depopulated that are low fence, wouldn't you like to be able to? select animals for replacement there that you felt would reduce their risk i mean it wouldn't not, just because it's uh, free ranging and low fence that wouldn't stop you from doing an inventory of uh, your your stock in different parts of your state and figuring out where the very best animals can be um, uh, triple teed from uh, for instance if you wanted to put animals back on ground that was depopulated either by anthrax or manually because of CWD. So I, I see it as a tool that could be used uh, for free ranging as well. It just uh, it just would have to be done a little bit differently. And if the singular goal of everyone is to reduce the prevalence of disease, I see how it can be applied very easily in farmed uh, cervids. I also can think of how I could implement a similar um, type of approach for free ranging stuff by selectively choosing animals to put back into um, regions that are that are positive or were positive and depopulated. Okay, next question. Um, we're going to stick with the so what are the details slide. Um, in that slide, uh, the question is why are there more animals on the left than the right, and what does that tell you? Oh. Uh, you'd have to go back. That's the distribution of predicted phenotypes. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason is uh, because there's because cases are always the rate limiting factor. Um, in other words, it's always harder to accumulate a large number of positive animals um, to be included in the study. So there's fewer positives um, than there are non-detects, and the heritability is very high. Um, and so it only makes sense that when you predict their phenotypes, what you see is, is that there are more that are predicted to be non-detect because of the high heritability and because of the actual composition of animals that are enrolled in the study, how many that are positive and how many that are non-detect. Okay, next question is, with the recognition that you have a 70% spec uh, specificity and you also have false positives and false negatives and false negatives are the fear factor, it seems that you are higher than 70% in reality. You could almost add in the false positives because they don't spread the disease. That was the statement. 
Well, the false positives are dangerous in that they, they're, you know, they have an increasing level of susceptibility and they just haven't been exposed yet. So um, the, 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 the fear factor there is if they come in contact with the agent that they would be more susceptible. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the, the, the sensitivity isn't quite 70%, but I think that it, I mean, it's getting there, it's almost there. Um, I think that uh, it, it will get to that and maybe a bit higher. So, um, yeah, I. What was the other part of the question? Um, I think you answered it. Okay. Uh, next one, and, and and this one is. Um, I think you already explained it, but I just want to ask the question. Miss Morton asked, um, with the recog. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, how would how would identifying CWD susceptible deer and how would this method be applied to identifying CWD susceptible deer in wild populations and adopting management practices in wild deer populations to breed out certain inheritable traits? You mean certain heritable traits? Correct. Uh, yeah. So, for instance, if I was uh, if I was in charge of I guess my state's uh, approach, I would want to do an inventory across the state. I would want to know, I would want to ask the research question, are there any parts of the state by ecoregion that are, you know, significantly more susceptible than others? I want to know where my, where my potential problematic areas may be in the future. Um, and I want to know where my strengths are so that uh, when I do perform triple T's, I can reduce risk. Uh, by by having a genetically or genomically informed triple T, that that would be, you know, that I think that would be an appropriate first start at answering that question. It's a tall order what you've just asked me. Some of it depends on new things that we learn. Okay. Um, here's the here's another question that just came in, um, and, and this is I'm sure what everybody has on their mind. And that is, um, do you have any recommendations for breeding selection at this time, such as breeding away from GG animals, et cetera? No, I, I, I think that I think that um, I don't want to go down that road because we've had some various different breeding strategies that have been uh, engaged in prior. And uh, what I want to say is that I think the best breeding strategy is is to to use genome wide data and and genetically evaluate the animals and and use that as a selection criteria. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't want to uh, make uh, any single gene sort of uh, recommendations at this time, but it is obvious, and I will not deny that the that the SS is the largest effect. Uh, region of the genome, but I will also point out that in this study, there are s the, the, there are animals that have SS that are positive, and so and it doesn't matter if they're only lymph node positive because positive is positive, and that's not what we want. We don't want positive animals. So I think uh, I think the the genomic the genetic evaluation is really going to be the way to do it so that you can capture all those additive alleles at one time in your breeding strategy. And it, it, it actually gives you the opportunity to breed up because even if you don't have animals that are, you know, the, the, the best of the best of the best on that far, far left side, right? Even if you don't have those, you can breed up to those, but you're starting at a much, much higher place because you're starting with animals that already have many of the advantageous additive alleles. And so I think that's the way to do it, to be honest with you. I'm going to um, I'm going to ask kind of three or four similar questions all in one. And that is um, availability of tests on, on a commercial basis for, for our industry, the cost of the test, and um, would you recommend entire herds or breeder bucks or just portions of does? Well, that's a hard question to answer because some of the answers to that question depend on the answers to other parts of your question. So 
this is not a commercial product. This is a custom homemade product that that can only be made at a minimum batch of 480. And right now it's pretty costly. It's kind of cost prohibitive right now because it's it's an R&D homemade tool. It's not a a mass commercial product for use. So I am attempting to make the mass commercial product for use, just as I said, to reduce the cost, but I'm trying to finish this blind validation thing before I before I uh, I do that. And uh, and you know, I would imagine that the price point will be very, very affordable um, if all goes as planned. So I need to finish this validation first. I have not, well, I can't, I can't even run anything for anybody, even if I wanted to, because I would have to order 480 more. And if I'm going to redesign the array anyway, to make it cheaper, it doesn't make any sense to do that right now. So I think what makes sense is to let me finish this validation project um, where I'm also at the same time, um, uh, redesigning the array so that when I get done with it, then we have something more like a commercial product that can be, you know, we can, we can say commit to buying a large number of of those chips and really drive the price down significantly. So, Dr. Seabury, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Yep. If there are any other questions, then. Uh, you can feel free to email me and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. There you go. Also, we'll be we'll be putting this recording up for those of you that weren't able to make it or or um, or asking for it. We, we know that's a constant question we get. Um, just give us a little bit to process it. Other than that, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, Dr. Seabury, thank you and all of the partners involved in the project. Um, it's just fantastic work. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all the funding partners and all the people who helped us get this done, particularly from TVMDL and various other agencies. Uh, A&M appreciates it and uh, we'll just keep plugging along. All right, thank you everyone, bye-bye.